Scouts Victoria respectfully acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Victoria where our activities take place today. We pay our respects to elders both past, present and emerging and continue to recognise and embrace the important continuous history and connection to land and community of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people. Hello and welcome to Scout Quest everyone. I'm Lawrence from Carlton Rover Unit and I'm also the State Commissioner for Environment. Uh, today we have another exciting guest, Brandon, from Wildlife Exposure. Hello, Hello everybody. Brandon. How you going? <laughs> yeah, good. How are you? Very good. Very exciting. Yeah, me too. So if you have any questions throughout today's presentation, please pop them in the chat and we'll try and get to as many as possible after our animal encounter. So Brandon, take it away. Take it away. All right. I'm excited to see questions come through too. So I should be able to see from here. So if any questions come through, I'll try and answer them as we go along, or I will give time to answer questions at the end. But look, to start off, my name is Brandon. I'm here today, of course, to show everyone on Facebook Live these exciting native animals. Now, straight away, if you're not sure, a native animal is an animal that is naturally found in our country. So today we are very lucky. We get to meet these animals up close. I know, unfortunately, we don't get to touch them because we are at home, but I think something even better than touching them, or maybe just as good, is that I can hold them super duper close, way closer than any other way I'd be able to show you them. Even if I was in the room with you, there's no way I could get them this close. They're close enough today that they'd be able to lick your nose. That's how close we're going to be. So you should be getting a good view of their eyes, their ears, their nose, their mouth, hopefully even their tongue. I'll try and get them so close. Take photos if you want as we go along as well, screenshots and things. Hopefully you get some really cool up close footage and uh, we can interact via, via questions as we go along. I do want to point out all the animals today are safe. They're not wild animals. They're not animals found uh, out in the wild that I've gone and collected. Although you can find these animals out in the wild, these ones were born here in captivity. So they're very used to people, very different uh, to what you'd find out in the wild. Having said all that, my first animal today, right now, she is actually asleep. She sleeps in the daytime. She wakes up at night. Now we call that nocturnal. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that word. Uh, a lot of people know that word when I ask them. Flip side of that, us, we don't come out in the nighttime, although sometimes some of us do. <laughs> Normally we come out in the daytime. We're actually known as diurnal. So I don't know how many people would have known that, but it's uncommon to know that one versus, versus nocturnal. But look, this little possum you're going to meet today her name is Gumnut. She's a ringtail possum. And she doesn't mind coming out in the daytime, contrary to what you might know in the wild. She's very used to people. So it's very different for her. There's no predators around. She knows that there's no birds that are going to eat her. So she's quite happy to come out and say hello. So she's sleeping just over here at the moment. I'll grab her out so she can say hello to us. Hey, Gumnut. Where are you? Oh, here she comes, everybody. Good girl. Have a look at little Gumnut. Isn't she cute? Uh, Gumnut, the ringtail possum, she's actually two years old. She lives for about eight to 10 years and she might get a little bigger than this, but she won't get a lot bigger. This is pretty much as big as she'll get. You can see up close, look how cute her little eyes are. There's these really little bulgy eyes. You can really see they sort of bulge almost right out of her head. That's of course for nocturnal vision. She has excellent nighttime vision. She's got whiskers here that help her to feel around. She feels around with those at night. And of course, the ring tail. The ring tail possum has what's known as a prehensile tail, which means grasping or grabbing to hold on to branches. You can see, look now, she's straightened it out over here. If I put my finger there like a branch, you watch her. Here we go. Ooh, ooh, ooh. There it is. <laughs> look at that. So she holds on pretty strong. In fact, that tail is strong enough that she can use it like a hand to hold on upside down. This doesn't hurt her, don't worry. Have a look how she hangs. She might even climb her own tail if we're lucky here. Watch her close, everyone. <laughs> Just like that. Excellent tree climbers. We don't have monkeys in Australia, but we do have possums, and they're excellent up in the trees. Just like monkeys. They're known as arboreal, and that means tree climbing. So in Australia, we're quite lucky to have these little possums. I want to point out a couple of things about her. Very similar to us, in fact. She has got hair. I know we call this hair, we call that fur, but same thing. It keeps us warm. We're in a certain group of animals, and I'm leading on to this group name in a second. But the three things that are quite similar is the hair, the fact that we have a warm body or warm blood, and when we're babies, we drink milk. So this makes us in a similar group of animals or the same group of animals known as mammals. I'm sure a lot of you know that. 
at home, that word mammals, you might even know uh, what type of mammal she is. She fits into a different group of mammals, different to us, you know. We don't have pouches. She has a pouch. When she started her life two years ago, she was only this big. She was as big as a jelly bean, and she lived inside her mum's pouch. So like a kangaroo, a koala, a wallaby, a wombat, a quoll, you might have to Google that one, a Tasmanian devil, a possum, of course, these mammals with pouches, we know them as marsupials. Some of you might have heard that before. In Australia, we're so lucky. We're like land of the marsupials. We've got so many marsupials in our country. where They're quite unique, a lot of them endemic, which means found nowhere else in the world. We are very, very lucky to have them. I think they're super duper cute. What do you reckon, Gumnut? <laughs> have a look how cute that little face is. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pop her away. I'm going to give her a little bit of a rest. She's going to have a little nap now. I want to show you where I'm putting her just so you can see. This here is a blankie that she absolutely loves. So don't worry if you're thinking right now, you know, I've squashed her in a bag. Don't panic. She loves this. It's dark. It's warm. It's safe. It's everything a possum looks for, even out in the wild. Unfortunately, of course, in the wild, they don't have blankies to hide in. Although if they did, I'm sure they would tuck in there. She tucks in here all day by herself. She's got a big box in her aviary outside. She goes in through a little hole and she sleeps in here all day. So she thinks she's sleeping right now. But um, in the wild, she would not have a blankie. Like I said, instead of a blankie, she would go in search for a hole in a tree called a hollow. I'm sure a lot of you at home have heard about hollows. They're found in trees, but they're found in trees that take up to 200 years to grow. So a really, really long time. Like we said before, these kind of possums live about eight to 10 years. So they can't wait around for a really big, you know, huge tree to grow 200 years to find a little hole that they can hide in from predators. The reason I'm telling you this is because over in here, I have another little possum. Again, he thinks he's fast asleep in his little hollow or in his little blankie. So he doesn't even know he's out of his enclosure yet. But this possum in here, he really needs a hollow. If he can't find a hollow, he will get eaten by another animal. And because of that, he is in a lot of trouble. He is endangered. Now that word endangered refers to animals that uh, could become extinct. So their population in the wild is declining. Something is happening to them in the wild. Something is causing the species to go to become less and less and less to the point where there might be none left. They all die. Now I think that would be really sad and I hope you think that would be sad too. So much so that I hope you would like to save him. We're gonna learn how to save this possum today. We are gonna meet him first, but uh, I hope you want, you're sitting at home right now thinking, oh yeah, I wanna learn how to save a possum. I'd love to learn how to save a possum. So we are gonna learn that. I'll get him out in just a sec. I do wanna quickly say though, he is known as a squirrel glider, not a sugar glider. If you're thinking of a sugar glider, a sugar glider is very similar to a squirrel glider, a little bit smaller, a little bit different with the black dorsal stripe you'll see in a second. But uh, this is a squirrel glider. They're a little bigger. His name is Dusky. And like all gliders, they can glide. Now, they can't fly. They're not, they're not like a bird. You know, they don't flap their wings around and fly around like a bird. They're more like, I like to say anyway, more like a paper aeroplane. They kind of just jump and glide like this from one tree to another tree. A bit like Buzz Lightyear, you know, falling with style. That's what they do. So hopefully today, if we're lucky, I'll be able to get him to glide. If you watch him close from my arm here, he might jump from my elbow. So keep your eyes open. Don't blink. I'll get him out just over here. Dusky, we call him. Again, Dusky doesn't mind coming out in the daytime. He's very used to people. So it doesn't bother him so much as what you would see out in the wild. Hey, Dusky. Here he comes, everyone. Good boy, Dusky. Up your jump. Have a look at little Dusky. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Such a cute little possum. And Dusky's actually three years old. So he's actually older than Gumnut, who we just met a second ago. Uh, but this is as big as he'll ever grow. Again, he lives maybe eight, 10 years, but he won't get any bigger than this. And because he's so small, unfortunately, lots of animals will try to <coughs> eat him. Predators like foxes, cats. Those are feral pests that have been introduced, but also native predators like birds and snakes. They'll all try to eat him, which is quite sad, but uh, he will keep himself safe if he can hide in that hole I just talked about a second ago called a hollow. He needs his hollow to keep himself safe from these predators. If he's quick enough, he can try and glide away using his little wing. And I'll try and show you this just in here. I'll turn him around so we get a really good look at it too. Right in here, here you go. That is his wing 
look at this side as well, known as a patagium or a membrane. That's an easier word, a patagium if you want to be really clever. That's his, yeah, flapping or gliding membrane that goes from tree to tree. Shouldn't say flapping, should say gliding, just glides. Like I said before, like a paper airplane. But he uses this tail here to help him steer. So he'll turn it left and right to be able to change direction as he glides in the air. He's got really good claws, look at this, to help him hold on. He won't fall down off my arm here. I can move my arm around like the wind in the branches. Look, there's no way he's going to fall off my arm. He's very good at this, very practiced at holding on. But what he should be doing right now is going, oh, hang on, it's daytime. In the daytime, there's birds around. I have to hide in my little hollow. So if you watch him here, if we're lucky, he might just do a little jump. Oh, <laughs> how cool is that? Isn't that awesome? That's amazing. What a cool little possum, hey? If you thought that was a big jump, that was a pretty good jump for him, but he can go a lot further than that. Little squirrel gliders like Dusky have been known to jump and glide up to 80, even 100 meters. That's insane. If you imagine how big your house is, it's probably longer than your whole house, unless you have a gigantic house. So that is absolutely crazy. They can jump that far. Normally, they jump out of a tree and glide sort of down a hill. As soon as, like, let's say a cat was to climb up the tree, they can jump and glide if they're quick enough and hopefully escape a dangerous cat in the wild. But look, I think he's really cool. I hope at home you're thinking right now, wow, that's a really cool animal. But remember, he is endangered. He's in trouble. There's not many of them left in, in Victoria in particular. They are an endangered species. So we're going to try and save him. We're going to learn how to save him right now. It's something you can do at home. Really, really, really easy. Of course, we need to understand first something happens to his trees. What do people do to trees? We chop them down. Deforestation. We cut trees down to turn trees into paper. I'm sure at home you use paper and I use paper. We all use paper. That's fine. But when you're finished with paper, of course, you throw it in the bin. Not the rubbish bin though, right? I hope everyone at home is going, not the rubbish bin, no. We throw it instead in the other bin called the recycling bin. If you're using a recycling bin, you are helping to save habitat for wildlife. It might not seem like a really big thing at the time, but what they do is they go and collect that old rubbish, that old paper that you've thrown in the bin, and they go and turn it into products that would normally come from trees. They leave the trees alone. They make the products from the paper instead. Things like this. You can see this. You've all probably seen this before. Toilet paper. This was so hard for me to get a month ago, so maybe you haven't seen it for a while, but I can get it again now. You can see up close, it's 100% recycled, not from a tree, from a recycling bin. And when you recycle, you help make products like this so they don't cut down trees. Possibly a tree that's 200 years old with a hollow where a possum lived. They can't wait again for another 200 years for another tree to grow. So you could be saving a really important home for a squirrel glider like Dusky. So if you recycle at home, give yourselves a huge clap. Well done, everyone. That is the first step to helping to save animals in the wild, helping to save habitat. Another step you could take is buying recycled products like that toilet paper there. Uh, try not to buy one with plastic on. <laughs> I know I've got plastic on that one, but even better again, try not to use plastic. But if you're recycling, you're helping to save wildlife. Not just possums, all sorts of animals, in fact. We need trees so we can breathe. My next animal also needs a tree. It lives in a tree. You've probably seen one of these before, especially if you're here where I live in Victoria. This next animal is a bird called a rainbow lorikeet. Oh, I've just seen Josephine in the comments here said, save the possums. Go Josephine, I like to see that. Haven't seen any questions come through yet, but any questions are welcome, like I said. We're gonna have a look at a rainbow lorikeet now. This rainbow lorikeet is named Buddy. And listen close because you might hear Buddy say a word. Buddy can say a few different words. He says, hello, he says, step up, he says, love you, something funny, or even <laughs> like a person. So hopefully if you listen, you will catch a word. You've probably seen one of these birds before, but today you're gonna get to meet Buddy up really close, and hopefully he shows off just a little bit for us. Wombat lions just said 100 meters is a huge jump, very impressive creatures. Squirrel gliders are absolutely impressive, I agree. That's a huge jump for such a small animal. But look, we're going to get Buddy out. I will bring him close, so don't panic if you can't see exactly what I'm doing right now. This is just a bit of newspaper in case he needs to go to the bathroom, so hopefully it doesn't go on my carpet down here at home. But I've got that for him. Hey, buddy. Step up. Good boy, buddy. Here we go. I'm just going to give him a few seconds. If he needs to go to the bathroom, he should go first. Maybe he's already gone. He might have already emptied the tank. There's a little bit of uh, a little bit tricky, you know, and everyone's watching, you know, a bit of, bit of shyness is common. <laughs> You don't need to go back. You're going to hold on to it. 
Right, good boy. Oh, no. All right, good boy. Here we go. Up here. Have a look at him up close. You can see his colors. Look at that blue on his head, the orange beak, blue on the head, orange on the chest, blue right on the belly again, and then on his back, the bright green. All these colors, of course, help him blend in the environment. So flowers and leaves in the environment, whether blue or orange, of course, green leaves, he will blend in. You might be thinking of the word I'm thinking of right now at home. The word I'm thinking of is camouflage. He is a master of camouflage. He avoids predators by pretending to sort of blend in with the environment, pretending he's a leaf or a flower. Do they come in other colors? I've just seen a question come through. Uh, they sort of can vary, so you can get different types of lorikeets, like a dusky lorikeet, for example, but the rainbow lorikeets look quite similar to Buddy. There's not too much variation in them. Good question. Uh, how old is he or, <laughs> he or she? It's funny you said that, actually. I'll tell you why that's funny in a second, but he's uh, about six years old at the moment, somewhere around there. I'm going to see if I can get him to show off a bit of a trick here. Just like all parrots, he's got two claws in the front, two in the back, so he can hang upside down. I want you to watch this. Ready, buddy? Step up here. Good boy. You're going to show us how you hang. Look, one, two, three, upside down. Woohoo! Just like that. He can even hang from one foot. If you watch him close, he might show us here. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Good boy, bud. Again. Good boy. Again. And again. Good boy. And again. <laughs> and again. And again. One more time. <laughs> I'm really giving him a push there. Well done, buddy. Good work, little bud. He loves to show off his tricks in the wild. If he's got some cool tricks, it'll help him to survive. It might even get him lots of friends and he shows off. The other lorikeets might go, Ooh, you're a cool lorikeet. He might even get himself a girlfriend <laughs> if he's really lucky. I think one of his coolest tricks is when he speaks. You can hear him saying some words now. If we're, oh, if we're lucky, we'll hear some words there. I just heard step up, buddy. Oh, thanks, bud. A little kiss there. Thank you. Buddy, you just said buddy. Step up. You just said step up. Hello. Hello. Normally he says hello after a little kiss. That's why I'm encouraging them. Hello. He's like, oh, there it was. <laughs> just when I spoke. Hello. No, he's letting me down today. He's gone quiet on me. Hello. There it is. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. Oh, we had to wait a while that time. Normally he's pretty quick to do that, but there you go. He let it out eventually. The hello is the cue for me to move on in his routine. He's very used to his routine. He's very used to doing these little bits and pieces. And he knows that once he does a behavior, that's the trigger to move on in the routine. So this is me training him right now. I haven't really trained him a lot at home. I've trained him a lot in shows just by encouraging certain behaviors. His last behavior, his last trick, if you like, is to do a bow. If he does a bow, what I want, I know he can't hear you, but I want you to, what I want you to do at home is give him a big clap because the clap normally tells him he's done the right thing. So I'll just go <laughs> to pretend like he can hear clapping today and hopefully that's good enough for him. Buddy, you ready for this? Here we go. We're going to do a bow. One, two, three. Step up here. Oh, 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 big bow. Whoop, there we go. <laughs> well done, buddy. <laughs> good job, buddy. Well done. Here we go. Sitting back there. Thank you, buddy. Buddy loves to come to work. He absolutely loves shows. He, uh, he comes and flies into this little carry box that I carry him in every single time I do a show. As soon as I walk in the enclosure, he goes, chip, 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 chip. Hello, hello, buddy, buddy, what's going on? And then he flies over into his little box. He's a great little bird. I'm just going to pop him back here. Give me one sec. Just there. Thank you, buddy. Now, I saw a few questions coming through, and I didn't answer them just then because I do want to tell you a bit of a funny story about Buddy. At home, you might have heard I was saying him, him, he, he, he. Do we think Buddy's a boy or a girl? If you think he's a boy, don't worry. I thought he was a boy for five years. And I found out not long ago when he went bloop and he laid an egg that all this time I thought he was a boy. He's actually a girl. So Bud's wiener is what I'm trying to call him now. I just can't get used to it after so long. It is a little bit funny. A couple questions came through there. How can you tell rainbow birds apart? Not easy at all to do in lorikeets. You can get them DNA sexed, which the vet will do. Uh, that's how normally people would tell. Some birds are very easy to tell. For example, I have another parrot uh, species here called Eclectus, and the, the females are bright red and purple, and the males are bright green. So they're very distinct. And if you can tell the difference, that's known as sexual dimorphism. So that's a big word. Sexual meaning male and female. Di meaning two. Morphism meaning shape. So male and female have two different shapes. That's what that breaks down into. Uh, not easy at all to tell in lorikeets, if at all you can tell. Uh, how far can the possum jump? We said about oh, 80, 80 to 100 metres. Depends on a hill. If they've got a hill that they go down, that's where they can go really, really far. But normally sort of tree to tree. I don't think they would be able to go that that far. It's normally 
with a drop where they can really glide a long distance. Um, one of my friends I work with actually found a squirrel glider in his backyard and it jumped from a really high tree branch all the way to the other side of his house. So he reckons that's about 50 meters. So that's pretty good. Uh, I can see a lot of comments. Hello. How cute is Buddy wanting the kisses? I know. Isn't he funny? Hey, loves his little kisses. Well, there's some good questions coming through now. We're really enjoying the show. Where am I filming from? My house. I've got like all these little animals at my house that I can get to show everybody. What's my favorite native animal and why? The tiger quoll. You might have to Google that. I do have some, but I can't show them, unfortunately, because they don't like to be transported a lot. Uh, I'm hoping maybe when I get babies, again, I can bring the babies to show everybody. But the adults, what I try and do is I try to breed them and then I can supply them out to the zoos. So the zoos can show them to you and you can see them. I do, do try and pick animals really carefully, though, based on if they like to be transported. If they're happy to be in a small environment for transportation. I'll try to choose them based on that so that they don't feel stressed or upset when I bring them. Uh, cool. There's the questions so far. Awesome. We're going to move on to an animal that has scaly skin, four legs. It is a type of lizard known as Stumpy. That's his name. And Stumpy's known as a shingleback or a really strange name, a two-headed lizard. A the reason they call them a two-headed lizard is because Stumpy here, he's got one, two heads. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Don't worry if you got tricked at home. Look, this is his head. This is his tail. His tail does look a lot like his head, and that is to trick a bird. So don't worry if you got tricked, it is a trick. An adaptation, if you know that word, that's like a trick to help the animal to survive. His tail here is full of fat, which means if he can't find food, he can last months and months and months with no food at all, just using the fat reserves in his tail. So what a clever adaptation. Other adaptations we've met so far, we've met, uh, Gumnut, oh, I almost forgot her name. <laughs> I've got a few of them. I'm trying to remember. Thinking, who did I bring? Did I bring Rufus? Did I bring Gumnut? Who did I bring? Gumnut, she's got a grippy prehensile tail. We saw that. We met Dusky and his gliding membrane buddy and his camouflaging feathers. Now we're meeting Stumpy and his two heads. What he does is if a bird is in the sky and looks down at him, he will look from above like he's got two heads. Birds would normally bite the lizard's head so the lizard can't bite back. But for Stumpy, he's really confusing. He looks like he can bite from this end and from this end. So the birds get scared and just leave him alone. How clever is that? Even a snake, if a snake came on the ground, he faces the snake like this. He goes, faces the snake like that. Looks like two lizards. The snake gets scared and whoosh, slithers off and he's completely safe. How smart is little Stumpy? What a clever lizard. You might have seen too his tongue. Look out for it. He pokes it out quite a bit normally. Oh, is he going to show us again? I saw it just a second ago. Here we go. One, I'm going to count him down. One, two, three. Give him a little tickle. No, he's letting me down. He'll do it. Don't panic. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> there it goes again. He's using his tongue for smelling. You can see he's got nostrils up the front here to breathe, but he does smell using that tongue. Here's my favorite bit of the show. Ready? Up close. Oh, oh let's get right near the camera. Here we go. <laughs> that would have been on your nose in a real show. How cool is that? What an awesome little lizard. He loves to poke out his tongue, pokes it out all the time to try to find food. You might have seen too. Up close, his scales, he's really, really bumpy in his scales. Known as a pine cone lizard as well, those scales help him to stay safe from bites and scratches from other animals. So he's really, really tough there from any uh, bite, but also he doesn't feel like the mammals. He hasn't got hair, of course. He doesn't have warm blood. He doesn't drink milk when he's a baby. He's a, a reptile. Reptiles are very different. Reptiles have got this scaly skin. In this case, he's got four legs but he does have cold blood. Like other reptiles, he has to go outside to get warm under the sun. He needs the sun to run. I'm gonna try and show you how he runs today. I've got a little platform, so I'll pick that up just so we can see. Uh, I've got a couple questions. I will answer them as soon as we're done here with Stumpy, but let's have a look how he moves. You can have a think at home. Is he fast? Is he slow? Let's have a look. Ready? One, two, three, and... Oh. <laughs> no, he's not very fast. Let's have a look. That's his top speed. He can go a little faster than that, but they're not a very quick lizard. Go, Stumpy boy. Off you, off you go. Go, buddy. <laughs> he doesn't have to be quick, really. We said already that he doesn't run away from a bird. He just pretends to have two heads to scare it. He also doesn't chase his food. He eats slow-moving things like snails and worms. They don't run away very fast. He also eats plants. He loves his strawberries. And you don't have to be fast to chase a strawberry either. So he doesn't have to be very quick. He can be pretty slow most of his life and he's fine. He just walks around poking out his tongue. One, two, three, Stumpy. And give us one more. Boom. <laughs> there we go. All right. I'm going to pop him back, everyone. couple questions going through right now. Uh, 
where do I find all the animals? We get them from all sorts of different places. Sometimes we get them from zoos and sanctuaries and things. If we could rescue an animal and we can't re-release it, that would be great. Uh, we can't normally use wild animals in shows because wild animals would be a bit too crazy. They've got wild instincts. But if we can breed them uh, and they're not allowed to be released into captivity, then that would be even better. We can use the babies to be able to show people and rear them so they become like an ambassador for their species. My qualifications, I've done magic shows for years, so that's why I sort of have this crazy presentation style, I suppose. But I also did a Bachelor of Biological Science at university. He's so nice, probably in the wild. That would be being them to, we'll see, it's tricky to see them. Do start uh, going great, Stumpy. How old is Stumpy? There's a good one. Stumpy's again about five years old, I think. I got him when he was, I think, just about one. So I've had him for about five years at the moment. Do I know if Stumpy's a boy or a girl? Again, quite tricky to tell. Stumpy is a boy. I've been told he's a boy. You normally look uh, just sort of at the head size for one. If it's bigger, it's a boy, but also at the scales between the back legs. So if there's lots of scales between the back legs, most likely that's a female because that means that they uh, they have enough room back there to be able to push out babies. They're quite a unique species. They don't have eggs like normal reptiles. They actually have live babies. So she, if it was a girl one, he's a boy one, but if it was a girl one, they can have about three babies and they come out about that big, the size between the front and the back legs. So that's humongous for a little shingleback to push out three that size. That's gigantic. Uh, but they have to do that because right from day one, they need to look like they have two heads to keep themselves safe against predators. There's lots of questions coming through. I'm sorry if I can't get to all the questions. I do want to try and get through all the animals. I promise I will leave time at the end for a couple more questions and I'll try and get through many as we go along. Can you have a pet stumpy? Yes, you can. You need a level one wildlife license to be able to do that. What breed? It's known as a shingleback. That's what we call them. Or a stumpy tail or a bobtail or a pop tail or a horseshoe or a two-headed lizard. There's so many different common names for them. Taliqua rugosa is the common name if you want to look that up. Am I a zookeeper? Sort of. It's like I have my own private wildlife. And we have a, a, a whole wildlife base in Torquay with all the animals there as well. Uh, he's so cool. How long can stumpy grow? About as big as you saw. He'll get a little bigger than that, but not much bigger. I want to show you a fast lizard. So this next lizard, much faster than Stumpy, it's known as a water dragon. Now, water dragons can be so fast, they can actually run on water. That's how quick they are. Now, not across a whole lake, but a small river. They can run straight across the top using their back legs. Look how cool they are. Here he is here. This is Spike. Have a look at Spike. Oh, he's got a big belly. He actually just ate food yesterday. So he's got a really big belly. I hope he doesn't go to the bathroom on me today. We'll see how we go. You can see his big long tail here. That helps him swim. Like a crocodile, he wiggles like this to swim in the water. He's got legs like a frog, you can see that. That will help him to jump, but it will definitely help him run. When he wants to run fast, he runs only on his back legs, just like he showed you then. He'll go right on his back legs to run across water. Why do we call him Spike? Up close, look at his head. He's got spikes on his head. Dragon lizards often have these spikes, but you know, for little Spike, it's a bit of a trick. Those spikes, they aren't sharp. We can call it an adaptation again because it looks dangerous for a bird, but actually it is soft. You can see if I rub that, this would be a cool one for you to be able to touch. So hopefully in the future you can touch one. They are very soft. That whole crest will move backwards and forwards if I bend it over. Looks dangerous, not dangerous at all. So a trick against a bird. Maybe not his best trick. He does have a better trick, I think. I think it's a very cool. I think probably might be the best trick we've seen so far, best adaptation. Dusky's membrane is pretty cool, but if he got really scared, he can flip on his back and pretend to be dead. That's what he does. You watch him. I'll flip him on his back. You see him, he moves his back legs now. If I flip him, watch close. Here we go. Oh, right now, he's playing dead so that I won't eat him. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that cool? That's got to be one of the best tricks going around in the animal kingdom. So clever. So if a bird came along, he'd do this, flip upside down, pretend to be dead. The birds would look at him and they'd go, oh. That probably tastes horrible. Could have been dead for months. I'm not going to try and eat that. Birds normally look for movement too, so they probably might not even see him. And he watches the birds. He can see with his eye there. Look, you can see over here. He's looking. He's like, Ooh. he'll watch the bird. He'll be like, oh, there it is. And then when it flies off, he'll go, ah, I tricked it. He'll flip up the right way and then shoof, run back into the water and he's completely safe. How clever is that? Super clever. I'm going to see if I can get him to run too. So watch close. I just had Shane ask, not Shane, sorry, just, uh, Sash, 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 Sathy, something like, sorry, I'm, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. How long are the, is Spike's tail? Right now, I would say that's about 30 centimetres. They grow just under a metre, fully grown. So a lot of that is tail. You can see how most of that would be tail there. 
Good question. Oh, Zach said, do some of the rainbow lorikeets have pink on them? They can slightly vary in color. I don't know about if you're thinking like a very vibrant pink. It's a bit of a, maybe a pinky red, but I haven't really seen many in the wild with a, with a vibrant pink No, I'm going to show you how it runs. So bring this up here. Have a look. I'm going to hold his tail so he doesn't run off because if he does run, I won't catch him again. <laughs> but at least you can see how he moves his little legs. Have a look at this. Here we go. Ooh, <laughs> he's been pretty good for me so far. He can all of a sudden just <laughs> do that. Look at that. He goes pretty quick when he wants to. If I tried to catch him, if he got away from me, I wouldn't get him again. He's pretty quick. One more. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> one more spike. Go on, one more for me. I'm lifting him up and putting him down. Don't worry. That doesn't hurt him. He's got really strong tail muscles. <laughs> wouldn't hurt him at all to hold on there. Good boy, Spike. You're a good boy. Look how cute he is up close. <laughs> what an awesome animal. I'm going to pop him away, everyone. Somebody asked why we call him a dragon. So the dragon lizards are a group of lizards. We have five different groups of lizards. So we've got things like skinks. We've got things like geckos. We've got an another one you're about to meet, so I won't give them all away now. Uh, the dragon lizards are fairly unique with the really spiky sort of skin you know like you might have seen a bearded dragon they've got, they've got spikes as well again a lot of those spikes are quite soft just as a bit of a trick i do want to show you another group of lizards i'm about to introduce you to behind me this next lizard is actually known as a lace monitor the second biggest lizard in all of australia you might have heard the word goanna Goanna is like our Australian term for monitor. And it can be a bit confusing, but the biggest monitor in the world or the biggest lizard in the world is known as a Komodo dragon. And weirdly, a Komodo dragon is not a dragon lizard, even though, you know, we do know about dragon lizards now. They've got those spikes. Komodo dragons are actually monitors. The only reason they call them a dragon is because they're like so big. You know, the legend of the size of this animal is so big, like a fire breathing dragon from TV that flies but it's not a dragon at all. So a bit of a weird name. It's known as a monitor, just like what we have here today. This is, like I said, second biggest monitor in Australia called Shade, the lace monitor. Does Spike eat fish? He would eat a couple of fish. Yeah, he he loves his insects. That's what he eats mainly. He eats a bit of plants as well. I actually feed him a little bit of dog food mixed in with insects, mealworms, you know, these sort of snacks for him. He loves his veggies as well. So a bit of a mixed diet, an omnivorous diet. Is he very spiky? He's a bit spiky, but like I said, they're a bit soft. Spike's about three years old. They are so tame. They are once they get used to people. So they do have to be very uh, used to people to be tame like that. In the wild, I've gone looking for them out in East Victoria. They're found in East Victoria. Can't get anywhere near them. They drop out of the tree so quick. You know, they sit in a branch, drop out of the tree, shoof, run across the water. You get nowhere near them unless you're really, really sneaky. Uh, what does Spiky eat? We covered that. Are their claws sharp? Quite sharp, not super sharp. When they get older, it'll be a bit sharper. But when he's little, no, they don't really cut my skin or anything like that, even when he wiggles. Uh, when did you get Spike? I got him about two years ago. So when he was really, really young. We have a bearded dragon. Awesome, Ashley. That's cool. Yeah, so quite similar to Spike. I'm going to get out Shade here. Shade, like I said, the lace monitor. up. Right now, she's asleep in here. Don't panic. Again, I said earlier, I try and pick the animals based on whether they'll be happy to be transported. Uh, this is a, this is a nice big bag for her, but for her, she would like to feel safe in a dark, small spot, just like the possums. The possums sort of we try and replicate a hollow environment. For the lizards, I had the other lizards in these pillowcases as well for transportation. They feel quite safe. They feel like they're in a burrow. So these animals that like to burrow or they like to hide in hollows, they love these dark, small spots. Work really good for us because it means they don't mind being transported in this kind of environment. You can see right now. Look, she's not moving. She's asleep. So I'll get her out. We'll see if Shade's ready to sort of wake up. Look out for her tongue. She hasn't got one tongue. She's got two tongues. So different to Spike, they've got a forked tongue to smell left and right. So keep your eyes out. Hopefully we can see the tongue really up close today. I'll bring her up here. Here we go. Oh, saw the tongue straight away. Look at that. Look at the tongue. Go again, Shade. Where's that tongue? Ooh, watch close, everyone. Don't blink. Up close to the camera. Let's see if we get a bit closer. Uh, oh, there it is oh, on the screen. How cool is that? You can see the fork right on the end there too when I brought her up close. The more I move her around normally, the more she forks the tongue or she, she pokes the tongue out to smell all the different smells. I'll get it right out so we can see. It's not just a big tongue. It's also a big body and big legs. Look at these legs. Big claws too. Look at the claws on her. Oh, those are some serious claws. She uses those to climb trees, dig holes, and catch other animals. Any animal her size or smaller. She's a carnivore, so she will hunt it. I've seen these lizards eating dead kangaroos on the side of the road, like four of them all munching away 
uh, which is really important in the environment if they eat dead animals because they actually clean up the environment by doing that. So she's like nature's garbage girl, if you like. <laughs> she goes around cleaning up all the dead things to keep the ecosystem really, really healthy. What's the craziest pet I've ever had from Victoria? Probably the tiger quolls. They're, they're really cool, but pretty crazy as well. They're quite, uh, they're like Tassie devils, very similar. Have a look at the rest of her body. Really big belly, big back, big back legs. Where's those back legs, Shane? Here we go. Oh, my favorite part about her too, her tail. Have a look at this tail. She has a long, 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 long tail. Look at the size of that tail. It's absolutely huge. I can barely keep her on the screen. Massive tail that she'll use like a whip. So if she was scared in the wild, she would whip away a dangerous animal. Now, don't worry. Shade is really friendly, but a wild one, no way would I go near them. They've got teeth like a tiger shark, claws that can rip skin, and the tail fully grown. If it whips you, it could crack your ribs. That's how strong they are. So no way would I touch them. But we're so lucky today because Shade has been doing shows with me for six years, ever since she was a baby. So she's six at the moment. Uh, she lives for about 30 years, never stops growing like all reptiles. They continue to grow their whole life. But she's very friendly, very happy to meet people and say hello. Hopefully one day you get to meet her at a show. Look at her cute little love heart on her head too. <laughs> How cool is that? I'll tell you what, if you saw one in the wild too, you probably wouldn't catch it, even if you were trying. They can run faster than a person. So a lot of people ask me straight away when I say that, especially at schools and kinders, can she run faster than Usain Bolt? <laughs> she can. She can run 45 kilometers an hour or thereabouts which is two kilometers faster than Usain Bolt. But I don't know if they found the Usain Bolt of Goannas when they tested that. So maybe there's a faster one out there. But somewhere around 45 Ks is what they say they can run at, which is super fast, faster than a car in a school zone. <laughs> Sometimes I get asked, can she run faster than a car? That's why I make that little joke. <laughs> but look, we're going to move on, everyone. We're going to have a look now at a different kind of reptile. We've met three reptiles, but all lizards. I want to show you a reptile now that has a shell on its back. A turtle, this turtle species is known as a broadshell turtle. So although it looks like the common turtles we have down South Victoria, Eastern Longneck turtles, they're known as, this is not an Eastern Longneck. Broadshells grow this big. They grow to a meter. So half neck, half shell. That's how they grow. Uh, huge, massive turtles. At the moment, though, this turtle's only little. She's one. Uh, she's a really tiny little turtle at the moment. Her name is Hyde. And her brother's called Seek. <laughs> I thought that was funny. But now, look, let's see if Hyde's going to hide from us today. Or hopefully she comes out of her shell. Here she comes. Whoop, have a look at Hyde. Look at that. <laughs> you can see, look how long the neck is. You see what I mean? Same length as the shell. So fully grown, half a meter of neck, half a meter of shell. She uses the neck to catch a fish. So she waits in her shell like this. When the fish comes close, chomp, strikes out just like a snake, catches the fish and then rips it up using her little claws in here. You can see those claws. You can see also when I hold the feet up, webbed feet, just like a duck, helps her swim. That tells me she's not a tortoise. Tortoises have stumpy legs for the land. Turtles have feet for swimming, either webbed feet or flippers like ocean turtles. She's not an ocean turtle because she doesn't have flippers, but she's also got claws. You can see the claws there. They help her to climb slippery rocks. And it's a bit funny because when they climb slippery rocks, they accidentally sometimes flip, fall upside down because they're really clumsy with this really big shell. Of course, she has to climb up the slippery rocks to get warm under the sun with the, with the rest of her body. But that shell is really big, really hard. She can't leave her shell, if that's what anyone's wanting to know right now. She is stuck into the shell. The shell is actually made of bone. So the same stuff we have in our bodies, keratin on the top, but made of bone. So that's for protection, obviously. Birds can't bite through the shell. Uh, crocodiles could, but she might not see many crocodiles, so she's pretty safe there. But like I was saying, when they climb those slippery rocks and flip, fall upside down, do you reckon they'd get stuck or do you reckon they can flip up? Have a guess right now at home. Have a think. Go, ooh, can she flip? Will she get stuck? What do we think? All right. Let's have a little look. We're going to test it out. I'm going to get my platform again that I have over here. I'll see if I can get it to show us. Here we go. Right here, the platform. I'm pretty good at balancing this now. When I started doing these online shows, I wasn't so good, but I never dropped an animal, so don't, don't worry. But I'm pretty good at it now. Have a look. If I flip her upside down, she does not want to stay upside down because she knows she's vulnerable. You see those legs? Those legs would get munched up by a bird if she was on her back. So as soon as I pop her, oh, Regan's already guessed flip. Let's have a look. As soon as I put her on her back, she's going to use her neck to push down into the ground. And one, two, three. <laughs> 
cool how cool is that isn't that clever don't worry oh she's going to the bathroom now <laughs> don't worry that does not hurt her to do that is actually really important it's good for her to practice that in the wild uh river turtles would do that probably on a daily basis so they get these strong neck muscles uh Pet turtles or tank turtles don't practice very often because they don't really fall upside down climbing slippery rocks. So it is good for her to practice that to try and build up those neck muscles. So really, really clever trick, clever adaptation, possibly not her best adaptation. She does have an even better one, I think. I think it's very funny. You might know this, but I'll tell you anyway. I think it's hilarious. You might see, look, hopefully you giggle about this. Ready? Get, it, get ready to giggle, everyone. You can see up close here, her nostrils. Oh, where are they? There they are. Right on the end of her head. Oh, she's tricky to keep her head still. Ooh, there we are <laughs> there they are two nostrils right on top of her head that's not the funny bit she breathes like a snorkel underwater like this but when she goes underwater she doesn't breathe from her nose she breathes from a different hole not her mouth if you're thinking of her mouth it's not her mouth it's a different hole if you're thinking of her ear it's not her ear it's a different hole if you're thinking of her bottom you'd be right turtles breathe from their bottoms underwater <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a funny little fact. I love that fact. <laughs> Clever little thing. I hope if you're at home and you're learning right now that that's not the only fact you remember, but <laughs> it is a good fact nonetheless. I think it's quite clever. Uh, how does she fit in her shell? Her neck is so long. Good question, Shane. Yeah. So she doesn't actually pull her neck back. Uh, she's, she's known as a side neck turtle. So when she pulls her head in, it'll sort of come like this and then like this. So it'll go sideways into her shell. She'll sort of tuck it in like that. Her legs will pull in like this. But again, she has that bend. She doesn't just go straight like, you know, suck her leg in like that. It does sort of bend in. And same with the head. They'll tuck it as a side-necked turtle. That's a great question. They live for about 30 years, this species. Tortoises can live a lot longer. Uh, some tortoise species can live, you know, over 100 years, 150 years. You might have seen Crush from Finding Nemo. You know, he said he's 150. So sea turtles as well. They live quite a while. Uh, hang on. A couple of other questions here. You could see the eyes. Yes, clever turtle, I know. What's dangerous for a lace monitor? Good question. Lace monitors are endangered here in Victoria. So it's ironic because they are an apex predator. So when they're fully grown, there's just about nothing that will eat them. A threat might be a human, might be a crocodile if they saw a crocodile, but not here in Victoria. Um, but in the wild, what happens to them is when they're born, they're only little. And when they're little, they get munched up by birds. But of course, our good old friends, Mr. Feral Fox and Mr. Feral Cat, they are terrible in the wild in Australia. They cause the extinction of so many different species. They're causing the endangerment of many, many, many different species. So they're no good in the wild here in Victoria, in Australia. They cause huge detriment to a lot of species. So when they're little, often monitors get munched up by those two feral introduced species or other predators. So that's the biggest threat to them. Um, how small are river turtles when they hatch? tiny absolutely tiny if you ever get a turtle at home as a pet please don't get it when it's only this big they that's like the shell size when they're born it's absolutely tiny really really small and they are very vulnerable so if you ever go to a pet shop and they're only that small try and ask to get it on hold and wait till it grows a bit bigger so they get a bit more resistance to water changes and things like that before you take it home uh, i've heard so many stories of people who get tiny turtles and they die because of the water change and they get quite a shock so that's a good question to ask a good one to bring up too uh, how do you tell boy and girl turtles apart underneath the shell if it's sort of convex so that it's it sort of got room, it sort of bulges outwards and there would be room to fit eggs in the belly. So that's one way to tell. Also the tail length in that species, if it's longer than the shell, so if it sticks out further than the shell, it's a boy one. That's a good question. Um, how do they poop from their bottom? Yep, that's how they poop. <laughs> how long does this have left? We're going to finish it at two o'clock and I'll give you a couple of minutes at the end for questions. Uh, do I have a koala? No, unfortunately I don't. I would love a koala, but again, issue with a koala for me anyway, is that they don't like to be transported in a small environment. So for me, I like to, like I said a few times already, I like to make sure that the animal is happy to be transported in a small environment, if it's dark or in the car, as long as they don't mind to be sort of sleeping throughout the day in that small enclosed space, then it's perfect for shows. I don't believe, in my opinion anyway, that a koala would be that satisfied in a very small environment for transportation. So that's why I don't have one. I try and only have animals that I can show to people or breed to give to zoos. That's my, my goal anyway. But go check out a zoo if you want to see a koala. Can't hold them in Victoria, but they are cool. I'm going to ask you a few questions now. Have a guess at home. Go play with mums and dads if anyone's listening in. We're going to try and see if we can guess this next animal. If you do guess it, pop a comment in and say, I got it right. I'll be very impressed because not many people get this next animal off the clues I'm about to tell you. Ready for this? This animal I'm about to bring out, it has got skin, no scales, no fur, no feathers. It lives in water 
and on land or even up a tree. It's got four legs, but it's not a reptile. Does anyone know what it could be? You can chuck a comment in if you think you know right now. It is very tricky to guess, although everyone at home does know this animal. You all know it. Um, but it's very funny when I give these clues, you know, normally teachers and, and also parents at birthday parties go, mm, they don't know when I say it, they get it. Shane, he's on it. <laughs> or Oscar, I mean. Oscar's got, there's lots of people coming through. I'm impressed. People at home, well done. Frog. It is, in fact, a frog. Easy if you think about the clues, but a lot of people don't think of it. A frog is known as an amphibian. So well done if you guess frog. There's heaps of comments coming through. Well done, everyone. It is a frog. This frog is called Freddo, of course, Freddo Frog. <laughs> Pretty original with the name. Uh, Freddo's not a chocolate frog, if that's what you're thinking. Freddo is a green tree frog. Right now, he's actually quite dark. So I'll bring him up here. We can get a good look at him. Here he is right here. Have a look at Freddo. Wow. Oh, he's off. Oh, he's off again. Oh, <laughs> lucky I'm quick with my hands. He's going to jump a bit, so watch him close, everyone. But Freddo is quite dark at the moment. He actually changes his color from bright green to dark green, like you're looking at now, even to brown. Hey, if we're lucky, you might jump on the camera, so watch close. <laughs> even to brown, like I was saying, to be able to camouflage in the environment with the trees. Being a, a green tree frog, he does live most of his life up in the trees. You can see up close, he's got sticky toes. See those? There they are. Sticky toes, see those? <laughs> um, silly sometimes. There you go. Those sticky toe pads is what helps him to hold on to the branches. Upside down shouldn't be a problem for him. Oh, he's off again. Oh, I'm so quick. Lucky I'm quick with my hands. Look at that. There you go. Upside down, not an issue. If he did fall off my hand right now, he wouldn't get hurt. He's got bendy bones. So frogs can fall out of trees. I reckon you might jump to the camera, everyone. Watch your face. Frogs can fall or jump out of a tree, hit the branches, hit the ground, like boop, 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 and they don't get hurt. Their bendy bones keep them safe. So if he was to jump off my hand now and fall on the ground, I've got carpet anyway. But if, even if I had hard floors, he'd be fine. Could fall, land on a rock, wouldn't get hurt. That's often how they escape predators. So quite a clever little adaptation there. You do have to be quite clever, uh, clever, careful with a frog with the skin though. You can see he's very wet. He does breathe and drink through his skin. So he sucks up water and air. And if you rub him, you can hurt him. So you do have to be quite careful with the frog. They suck it all up. If you watch closely, every now and then he squirts water at his bottom. So that's always a bit funny. Last week I said that and I said, wow. When I said, wow, he went and squirted straight in my mouth. And everyone, <laughs> everyone thought that was so funny, except me. <laughs> no, I had a laugh. Have a look at him up close here. You can see his little smile, his big bulgy eyes. He actually uses those eyes to push food down his throat when he, when he eats. He uses them like muscles, if you like, to push the food down his neck. That's a funky fact. Of course, too, he wasn't a frog his whole life. He started his life, hatched from an egg as a tadpole, turned into a froglet, which is a frog that still has its tail, then lost the tail, turned into a frog. That whole process known as a life cycle, or if you're very clever at home and you want to learn a big word, metamorphosis. What a cool word. I'm going to pop him back, everyone. I want to show you where I'm putting him. Again, transport. This is his transport container. He doesn't live here. He's got a big enclosure. Like all the animals I've got, they've all got really big enclosures. Uh, so they feel happy in there. But he's got this carry container with water that has to come from his enclosure. You see that water in there? If I <laughs> have a look at him underneath, that's pretty cool. <laughs> if I got that water there from a tap, the water we drink, it could make him sick. He might even die. So it's really important that a frog has super clean water. If in the wild the rivers got dirty, the frogs would die. So pollution is a huge uh, problem for frogs out in the wild. We do have to make a huge effort to try and make sure our river systems stay clean. But if you ever see a river with a frog in it and it's alive, you know straight away that that environment is healthy for other animals. Not for us to drink the water, but frogs indicate to us that the ecosystem is functioning in a healthy way. Isn't that cool? All right. Well, what do I feed him? Someone said. Crickets, cockroaches, mealworms, that's what he loves. He is an insectivore. He loves to eat insects. How old is he? He's about five, I think. They live for about 20 years, so they do get a lot bigger. Does he have a tongue? Not like the tongue you've seen on TV that goes and shoots out to grab a fly, but he does have a really sort of flappy, fleshy tongue that he uses to sort of stick to the to the cricket. So he holds the cricket with his little feet. He goes, and then he like moves it around his face. It's kind of messy when they eat, but pretty cool. How do you tell if it's a boy or a girl? I was about to answer right now. Uh, if you can't see a frog in the wild, you can often hear it. And if you hear the frog go exactly like this, ready? I've practiced that a long time. That's exactly what he sounds like, identical. That's his call. They all have different calls. But if you hear a frog make a call, whether it's that call, like a green tree frog or like another type of frog, 
you will know it's a boy because only boy frogs croak. How cool is that? Are they endangered? No, not this species. There are many species here in Victoria that are endangered from something called the citrid fungus uh, or other types of water pollution, but he's not an endangered species. No, he's doing quite well, found up in New South Wales and Queensland. Queensland. <laughs> I want to bring out now an animal that is very, very different. No arms, no legs. It is, of course, a snake, but not a dangerous snake. If you're thinking, I'm going to come out now with this crazy venomous snake, no. It is a safe snake. All my animals are safe. I try and pick safe animals, again, for handling purposes so we can touch them and love them. This snake I've got today is called a python. Pythons don't have venom. So in Victoria, where we live, we have about 25 different snakes. And these snakes, out of those 25, 23 of them have got venom. So if you find a snake on the ground, don't touch it. In Victoria, they are deadly dangerous. So many snakes we have here in our state are deadly dangerous. If you see one, stand still. Don't make a move. Snakes feel movement on their belly, but they can't hear you. They don't have ears. So you can quietly back away. When you're far enough, run, go tell everyone there's a snake. And if you leave it alone, it'll leave you alone. Jody Ann Harris, I'm out of here. No way, stick around because this is the coolest part of the show. I'm going to try now. This is my my ultimate goal to be able to encourage you to appreciate snakes in the wild. Even if you don't like snakes, especially wild venomous snakes, this is a safe snake. It is very interesting to look at up close, really important in the environment. Hopefully you'll think this snake is pretty. He's a python called Strike. He doesn't strike, don't worry. He's just got striking colors. Uh, he's called a jungle python, found up in Queensland. He's got beautiful colors. Have a look at him. Wow, look at that colors. Yellow like the sun, black like the shadows to help him with his camouflage. You can hopefully see his head up close. He doesn't wiggle around too much. He is quite a squirmy snake, so he doesn't sit too still for the camera. <laughs> you know, work, work out where your head is, mate. There you go. Oh, 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 oh. Got to be quick. Oh, oh, there it is. Look at the tongue. <laughs> cool snake. You see his scales up really close here. Not dirty, not slimy, not smelly, not yucky, nothing. He's clean. If you feel, you can see if I feel here, it's quite rubbery. He's uh, very, very clean. A lot of people think he'll be slimy, but no. If he was to get dirty, he would shed his skin. That's what it looks like. And don't worry, this is not yuck. It's just like paper. If I wiggle it, you can hear. Really, really dry. Exactly like baking paper, if you know what that feels like. And that comes off him at the moment about every three months. So that came off him about two weeks ago. But they shed as they grow, as they eat. So the bigger or the more he eats, the more often he'll shed. He can eat right now something as big as a fully grown rabbit um, pretty comfortably. And a lot of people say, what? How can he eat a fully grown rabbit? Look how small his head is. It's tiny, but it's not like us. If you were to feel your chin, you would feel that bone in your chin snakes don't have. Instead of that bone, they've got a stretchy ligament, which allows them to stretch their jaw here, 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 to open their mouth eight times as big as their head to eat something huge. If he ate something big enough, he might not eat again for a week, a month, even up to a year with no food at all. How crazy is that? Really important predators in the wild. We need these guys in Australia because they're an important predator that doesn't eat too many prey items. So snakes eat mice and rats. That's great. It means we don't have mice and rats. They also eat possums. That sounds sad, but it is also very important. If there weren't snakes to eat possums, we'd have so many possums. They'd eat all the leaves. And if, and if they ate all the leaves, there'd be no leaves left for other animals like koalas. So we do need some predators to make a balance in the environment with our prey. Um, <laughs> you're a wiggly one today. The problem is, is that when you get some predators, for example, cats in the wild that can kill, not eat, but kill up to 80 native marsupials or prey items per night, that's not sustainable. So snakes like this, he'll eat once a week, maybe a small possum. He might not eat again, like we said, for a week or a couple of weeks. And that way he's not eating too many prey. Uh, and the prey is okay. They can be sort of sustained in the right numbers in the wild. They don't go endangered. Something like a cat will cause the endangerment of many, many species. In Australia, we have the highest extinction rate of any other country, and that is because of our good old friends, Mr. Feral Fox and Feral Cats. So it would be probably safe to say I don't like cats. I do love cats as a pet. I think they're awesome pets. I actually have a cat, in fact, as a pet. I don't let it outside because I know they have uh, an instinct to hunt, but in the wild, they're no good. Cats in the wild in Australia destroy our environment. So I don't like wild cats, definitely not, uh, but I do think cats are a beautiful animal. So a lot of people ask me that. Uh, he's about, oh, he's probably a metre and a half. He'll grow to about two, two metres, if he's lucky, two and a half maybe. I feed him rats. 
So a rat's about that big at the moment, once a week, once every two weeks. Is he fully grown? No, they, they grow forever, their whole life. They live for 30 years. Uh, he will grow to about, yeah, like just over two metres, hopefully. Um, by the time he's 30, that's when he'll be his biggest size. What do you feed? Spike. Spike, I feed bits of, fr uh, bits of veg and meat. What do I feed him? Rats, we said. I learned a lot at this zoo. That's good to see. Sorry, I missed a bit of questions as I was going along there. Um, all right, we've got one last animal. I want to quickly get through that so we run out, of, so we don't run out of time. Um, I will leave questions at the end. But this last animal, of course, is the world's biggest reptile, the saltwater crocodile. Now, don't worry, it's not as big as it will be one day. I haven't got an eight meter crocodile here, but I do encourage you at the end of our talk to go outside or go find a space where you can take eight big steps. That's how big a crocodile, saltwater crocodile, will grow. Biggest record, I think, is 7.2 or something like that metres, but there's been stories of, of crocs that are like over eight metres long. So let's say somewhere around eight metres is how big this crocodile can grow. That is mind-blowing, like a dinosaur. But look, my crocodile today, my little salty, she's very cute. She's very small. Her name is Crikey. Uh, Crikey's actually a blonde saltwater crocodile. So just like people, you can get blonde people, you can get blonde-scaled crocs. Normally they're dark, but this one's blonde. She's beautiful, but she's only one. So she's only tiny right now. She's very cute, like a little lizard. Here she is. <laughs> Look how cute Crikey is. Oh, I love her at this size. She's so tiny and cute. You can see what I mean by the colours, the yellowish coloration to the scales, the tail there as well. You can see yellowish sort of scales. That's the blonde. Webbed feet there, like a turtle to swim. They've got ooh, spikes all over their tail called scoot scales to help her warm up in the sun, look a bit like a dangerous dinosaur. And, of course, these teeth, everyone's favourite part. I can't do this in a normal show, but I can gently encourage her here to open her mouth so we can get a good look here. Here we go. Watch your fingers, Brandon. Don't do something silly now. Ooh. I'd encourage her a couple of times. Normally she's pretty good. Oh, there we go. Ooh. Watch your fingers, Brandon. She will open it again. Don't worry. She just likes to have a little wiggle. Once she's worked out what I'm trying to do, she'll open her mouth. I'm trying to train her, actually. So another croc crocodile that I use, I click. And with the click, they open their mouth because they know that I would click and then open like that. So hopefully she'll get better. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> she's got 66 sharp teeth. And those teeth in there, they're so sharp. If she bit me now, there'd be quite a bit of blood. When she's two, she could rip off a finger. When she's fully grown, she can bite a human in half. That's how strong they are. So no way would you go swimming with a wild saltwater crocodile. But up close, look how cool they are. We're pretty lucky today to see this. You can see her nostrils on the top. You can see her ear. It's that little slit there behind her eye just there. You might even see if she blinks, a clear eyelid that goes across her eye. Oh, now I've closed the whole eye. She opens it again. Clear eyelid that goes across like goggles to see underwater called a nictitating membrane. Funky little word. I don't think she's going to open it again now for us. She's going, no, nope, I'm going to keep that closed. <laughs> Very clever. She's keeping herself nice and safe. She lost one of those teeth. She can grow it back over 60 times. How cool is that? I hope you like dinosaurs at home. If you like dinosaurs, crocodilians have been around for hundreds of millions of years with the dinosaurs. The saltwater crocodiles are slightly modified since then, but this is the closest living thing to a modern day dinosaur. Isn't that cool, hey? What do you think? <laughs> what an awesome animal. I'm going to pop her back, everyone. I do want to just quickly read through those couple of comments that I missed right on the end there. So I'll just quickly scroll through. How old is he? Uh, who are we talking about? Are we talking about Strike? Strike is about, he must be coming on five as well. So a lot of the animals are five. I got a lot of animals five around five or six years ago. Um, the crocodile is only one, if that's what you were talking about. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, D. Um, she's cute, not as big as I thought. I know she's very cute at the moment. Can you keep crocs as a pet under a special license? You can. They're not always easy to get. A lot of native species aren't easy to get unless you have special licenses like us to demonstrate the animals. Uh, but some some private people, they can get them. You can get a private license to own some of our native animals. In fact, I do encourage people to get pets that are native rather than getting things like cats because even pet cats get outside and like to play with the natives. And when I say play, I mean play too rough and end up killing them so it is much better if you can have i think anyway to have a, a native animal as a pet a possum is a very cute pet maybe not as cuddly as a cat but very cute nonetheless uh how do crocodiles swim with their tail so they move their tail like that to be able to swim tuck in their legs and they go really really fast in the water will she bite uh she does have an instinct i think to protect herself when she's small 
normally most animals when they're small in fact they are a bit scared so a lot of snake species are a bit bitey when they're young but when they get older they calm right down once they recognize we're not trying to hurt them uh crikey probably would bite me if i stuck my finger in there to instinct my aim is to handle her enough that she knows i'm not a threat and hopefully then she won't try and bite but i do believe that crocodiles are one of very few animals that is very very tricky to train unlike a lot of the other animals like the lace monitor you met who is very very easy to train she gets very comfortable crocodiles being apex predators they have this instinct to be a little bit dominant over a lot of other species so i aim to try and get her really really comfortable and other crocodiles that i have in use Again, they are very comfortable in this environment. They're very used to people, but I still think if I stuck my finger in the water, snap, she'd bite my finger off. <laughs> so you do have to be very careful with the crocodile. Uh, if I get the crocodile angry, does it hurt you? It's never bitten me before. None of the crocodiles have bitten me before. I'm very careful and I don't get them angry. I try and make sure they are as comfortable as possible at all times. Couple questions left, guys, and then I'll open back to Scout Quest. Uh, I like trains. Thanks, Angela. <laughs> oh, they're all coming through now. There's so many questions I can't even read them. Where do you keep her? I keep her in a like a sort of like a pond. I've got some tanks as well when they're little, but I'll have ponds at the back that are heated. Um, super fun. Uh, oh, there's one question there. What will you do with the croc when when she gets too big to handle? Good question. I think the regulation in Victoria is 2.2 metres to be able to demonstrate them. So once they get to that size, to take them off the property and show people that the cutoff is 2.2. After that time, I think you then can have them on property, sort of like in a zoo environment where people come to you. But again, then we're not a zoo that people come to us yet, maybe in the future, but not at this stage. So most likely we'll give her to a sanctuary or a zoo, somewhere maybe back up in Darwin, uh, and then they can show them on display where people can come and visit them. And hopefully that ties in really nicely because they're very used to people. So they won't be stressed out and they will eat for that for that, for that that zoo really comfortably. Mm. Good question. I have a question for you, Brandon. Can yeah. you play fetch with Shade the lace monitor? <laughs> Shade is a little bit dog-like. I would say she does sort of play a little bit like a dog. You can, you can wiggle things. Like if I've got a chicken oh. that she likes to eat, I'll sort of, you know, wiggle that around and she'll do that and sort of tear away at it. But... As for going to grab something and bringing it back, no, nah, she wouldn't bring it back because she just wants to try and eat and kill everything that she thinks is food. So if I chuck something, she'll be like, that's a mouse, go, 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 grab it and then try to munch it. Fair enough. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time today, Brandon, um, and for answering so many questions for us. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, keep an eye out for our exciting end of term event next Saturday for Scout Quest. And uh, thanks for tuning in. It's been awesome. Thanks, everyone. If you've got any more questions you want to ask, you're welcome to shoot them through to Wildlife Exposure. Check us out online. You might be able to see the website, Facebook page. Go and look at my Facebook page if you want as well. You can see all the animals you've met today. But definitely check out Wildlife Exposure's YouTube and all of that. We've got some cool videos up. So you can keep an eye out on all the animals. Thank you so much, everyone. See ya. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>